Welcome everybody to our worship service. This is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost and also obviously a Labor Day weekend. And you know, uh, Labor Day weekend, a time for us to you know, celebrate um, our labor, but also to take a rest, to have a long weekend and to, to receive some rest and rest it. Um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes people use that as a reason to rest from their worship as well. And, and I'm grateful that all of you um, have decided to make this a part of your Labor Day weekend to come and, and worship the Lord. And with that, I want to offer a challenge to you this morning. Too often when we come to worship, we become very passive about it and just kind of let the words kind of wash on by and really don't pay much attention. And so what I want to encourage you to do, even though we're using Divine Service 3, page 184 and following, that's the one we're probably the most familiar with, and that's the easiest one for us to kind of just uh, become passive and, and, and just uh, kind of cruise and not really pay attention to what we're saying or what we're singing or what is being said to us. And so I want to encourage you to work at your worship today with every song, every prayer, um, every moment. Not be passive, but be focused. And so the Old Testament lesson for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost is from the 15th chapter of Jeremiah. <laughs> o Lord, you know. Remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. And if you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth, and they shall turn to you but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you, for I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 12. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by do so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. 
not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the gospel. Hallelujah. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Hallelujah. It's the continuation of the Holy Gospel according to the 16th chapter of St. Matthew. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. Well, then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with the angels in the glory of the Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Now we speak our common faith at the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten from my faith, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for our sin and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text that focuses our meditation today is the gospel lesson read earlier. Dear friends of Christ, tomorrow we in here in America celebrate the holiday of Labor Day. Originally, this holiday was a day to celebrate the laborer of America with parades and speeches, but now it's become a time for us to gather together as family and friends, to gather around the barbecue, eat gobs of hamburgers, hot dogs, ribs, pork steaks, potato salad, watermelon, sweet corn, 
become one of those iconic holidays in America that most all of us enjoy. When I think of Labor Day, however, I think of a friend of mine back home. His name was Harley Yoder. He's a Mennonite. Now, he's not the old order horse and buggy kind of Mennonite. Harley drives a fairly new black Ford diesel pickup. I got to know Harley as he and his crew that consisted of his son and his brother put up a metal framed freestall barn for us several years ago. The summer that they were building this was one of those summers where it seemed to rain all the time and that rain came in the form of a thunderstorm. And for some strange reason, sitting on the top of a 30 foot, sitting up in the air 30 foot and on a steel beam trying to weld, didn't seem like in the middle of a thunderstorm, didn't seem like a good idea to Harley. So they were behind, way behind. And as Labor Day approached, it became obvious that they were going to have to work on Labor Day. In fact, on Saturday, as they were packing up their stuff to go home, Harley told me, well, guess Monday's Labor Day. Guess we'll just be here laboring away. And they were. Labor Day gives us a chance as well to stop and ponder just what it means to be to be laboring away as followers of Jesus. Our gospel reading for today gives us a little insight into what that kind of life, laboring away, following Jesus, really looks like. Here Jesus be begins the process of revealing to his disciples, to those who follow him, to us, just what it is he's come here to do. He has come here and he is now heading to Jerusalem. It's something he must do. He is following the plan that has been laid out for him, revealed in the words of the Old Testament. He must go to Jerusalem. He has to leave behind Galilee. He must go to Jerusalem and confront the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the elders, the chief priests, the scribes. Up to this point, Jesus has always avoided that confrontation. He's withdrawn from it as he learned of their plan to have him put to death. He left behind Jerusalem and the regions around it, and he went to Galilee. When they came to Galilee to confront him there, he and his disciples got in the boats, and they went across the lake. Jesus chose to withdraw from the confrontation, but not anymore. From this point forward, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He will confront those leaders there. And he labors under the certain knowledge of what awaits him there, death. He labors knowing there is no other option. But he labors knowing as well that this is not the end. Somehow Peter and his fellow disciples, they miss the fact that Jesus says he will be raised from the dead. They hear that part about the suffering and the dying, but they just can't quite wrap their minds around. Somehow they just can't quite hear that part about how Jesus will be raised from the dead. So Peter, even though he's just made this great confession for himself, for his fellow disciples, that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter still, in what he is about to say, proves that he just doesn't really get it. He doesn't fully understand what that means. Peter and his fellow disciples have their own idea about what labor in the kingdom of heaven looks like. How the kingdom of heaven is going to break into this world. And it looks an awful lot like the ways of this world. For Peter and his fellow disciples, successful labor in the kingdom of heaven means acquiring power, wealth, prestige. It means an ele you elevate yourself above those who oppose you. 
There's nothing in their frame of reference that allows them to understand that Jesus has come to defeat death by dying and being raised back to life. They just can't quite wrap their minds around that. So Peter attempts to set Jesus straight. Peter attempts to tell Jesus how he's supposed to do it. And in Jesus' response to Peter, we learn just how radically different the kingdom of heaven is from the ways of the world. Jesus hasn't come to defeat his enemies to, by acquiring power, prestige, wealth. He hasn't come to elevate himself above those who oppose him. He has come to fulfill the very scriptures that speak about him. He has come to live out his labor by doing the things his father has sent him here to do. He comes to suffer and to die. And he calls his followers to the same kind of life. A life of suffering and dying to ourselves. We hear in the words of Jesus to his disciples, and that means not only Peter and the eleven who were with him, but to each one of us who have been called to follow Jesus. We hear in his words what that life of labor following him looks like. If anyone would come after me, let him first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. This looks nothing at all like the, what the world views as successful labor. This isn't about acquiring power, wealth, or prestige. It isn't about elevating ourselves above our enemies. It's not about self-satisfaction or self-relevance. It's more about doing what we want, or rather how we see our life is more about doing what we want, when we want it, acquiring the top dollar for our labors, and using that money to buy what it is our heart desires. There's no room in our own definitions for of success, for self-sacrifice. There's no room in the age of the selfie and social media for self-denial, but that is the life Jesus has called us to. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And what does it look like to take up our cross? The cross is an instrument of death, cruel, brutal, agonizing death. It was a kind of death that was meant to maximize the humiliation of the victim of that death. As they're lifted high for all the world to see, as they hang there gasping for their final breath. That's the kind of death Jesus has come to die, and that's the kind of death Jesus has told us we must put our selfish, sinful selves to as well. It's not a pretty thing in the eyes of the world, but it's the kind of death we are to suffer. It means we must give up that idea that our way is the right way. We must instead follow selflessly serving Christ and his kingdom. We must carry our cross and follow Jesus. Even though it means we will suffer for the proclamation of the gospel, for the advance of his kingdom. After all, look at what they did to Christ. Do you think will be any different? But it also means we're called to a point where we actually find life. Life in Christ. 
life that is everlasting, eternal life. That's life just laboring away as we carry our cross and follow him. Where did this life take Jesus? It took him to a barren hill on the outskirts of Jerusalem. There he carried his cross. There sinful men elevated him high in all his glorious humiliation. There he suffered at the hands of sinful men as he bled and died, emptying himself of everything, even life itself. As he served humanity, as he gave up his life, to restore the brokenness of creation brought on by our own sinful actions. There, Jesus found life for us. All whom the Holy Spirit has called to faith to the waters of baptism. What's this life look like for us? Well, Paul gives us a, a pretty good idea of what this life looks like in the words of our epistle. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We got a good picture of the two extremes, how the world views labor, successful labor in this life, and how life as a follower of Christ carrying our cross views successful labor in the recent events that took place in Ferguson. On the one hand, we see how the world views this kind of success. If someone hates you, return hatred. If they confront you, yell at them. If your enemy brings a stick to the fight, get a bigger stick. Might makes right. But we also got a glimpse of life just laboring away, carrying our cross, following Jesus. What that looks like as well. As clergy wearing their clerical collars, many of them LCMS pastors, at risk to their own lives, took to the streets. They visited with whoever they came in contact with, stopped talked with them, shared the love of Christ with them, prayed with them. They be showed what it meant to be a follower of Christ. And in doing so, they brought a little peace to a volatile situation. They allowed the tempers to calm down a little bit. They gave a little time for the hurt to start healing. That is life just laboring away, carrying your cross, following Jesus. And it's the life each of us has been called to as well. We are to deny ourselves, put to death that old sinful Adam that wants to live in us, turn in repentance from that life, turn to Christ, receive from him the life that has been given to us in our baptism, his life, eternal life, life that reaches out in love to our neighbor, life that serves the others even at the expense of ourselves. This is the life we have been called to. Life just laboring away as we carry our cross, deny ourselves, and follow Jesus. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, strengthen and preserve you now and always in the one.